There's a little known part of Hollywood that most people are not aware of, known as the audience test preview. The recently released book, Audienceology, reveals this for the first time. Our podcast series, Don't Kill the Messenger, brings this book to life, taking a peek behind the curtain. And now, join author and entertainment research expert, Kevin Getz. Most of you know that in recent years, there's been an absolute explosion of documentary filmmaking that has really fueled this insatiable demand from streaming platforms. Today, documentaries are in a much stronger position in the hierarchy of entertainment. And this genre of filmmaking is really changing the industry in what I really believe very exciting ways. My guest today is Oscar and Emmy-nominated documentary director and producer Yevgeny Afanievsky. His work includes Winter on Fire, Francesco, and Cries from Syria. With over 20 years of experience, Yevgeny has become a leading voice in the documentary field with his commitment to sharing important stories that have a global impact. He's become a friend of mine, and I am so pleased and privileged to have him here today. Welcome, Yevgeny. Hi, Kevin. Thank you for having me here. I have so much to talk to you about, but if ever there was a filmmaker with a purpose beyond entertainment, it is you. I know you have also directed and produced Lighter Fair, but let's start with the inspiration for your more serious work. Tell me about your childhood growing up in a part of the Soviet Union. You know, it was a former Soviet Union, actually, because I left before 91, a collapse of Soviet Union. So when the perestroika was already for the second year, perestroika started in 1989. I love you, a perestroika. Uh, perestroika, yeah. <laughs> I have a strong R. And in 91, I left, and it was something that I wanted to do because I not felt that I have a future in Russia. I was dreaming to be a filmmaker. You were, as a child. True. But you know what? Being just uh, somebody who is trying to to do it on its own uh, through the club, through the social club, it's different than to do movies with the purpose for the audience. It's two different things. Today, you literally have all the tools. This new generation have all the tools. They're taking cell phone, making a little movie and uh, able on their own cell phone even edit this and then putting this on YouTube and millions of viewers. TikTok became one of these platforms that allowed mini movies being seen by millions of people all over the world. When I was growing in 1980, we can say that the only luxury of the film was the real film and the real camera and the old traditional process of splicing. Did you see movies as a child? Yes, I did. Like what was one of your influential movies as a kid? You know, if you're talking about Russia or if you're talking about specifically foreign movies. Whatever you saw as a child in Russia, would yeah. they have been Russian movies or would they have oh, been, yes. so I would saw they have been American movies? You know what? Yes. When I was in the school in the 80s, I've been able to see like movies like Gone with the Wind. And it was a big hit in Russia. Yeah. And was that really meaningful for you? You know what? It was interesting because people were so excited to see something that was done beyond our borders. And it's in the cinemas. And it was even hard sometimes to get the tickets for these type of movies. I think Russia in the 80s had impact from Bollywood movies, India. Because I remember some of the traditional Bollywood yes. movies. Another movie that pierced the borders of Russia was Flew on the, Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which also I saw when I was in school towards the older age. So you went to Israel from Russia, and did you study film there? No. It wasn't until you came to the United States. In about what year are we talking then? You know what? United States, I moved officially in 99, but I've been first time in the United States in 96. Let's take a step back. In Israel, I was living in 90s, beginning of 90s, where the movies were also only film. Digital was just entering. And I was doing a lot of stage production. As, as a, a producer. producer. Ah. Yeah. And whom I met, somebody whom you really know, somebody whom this industry know really good, specifically uh, old generation. Topol. Uh, no. Uh, somebody who... Arnon Milshan. No, no. Uh, everybody remember <laughs> GG, Gimel Gimel, and uh, everybody remember Golden Globus. So I met Menachem. Oh, Menachem Golan. Oh, I love how you said Menachem Golan. Yeah, I met Menachem who... Well, my Hebrew name is Mordechai. Oh, so my Hebrew name is uh, Gavriel, which I love. That's easier to pronounce than your Russian name, uh, yeah, by the for way. Sure. 
Uh, so I met Menachem in Israel, and I think it was exactly the period when he lost everything in 20th century. You remember the scandal? Hold on. I worked on his movies in the States in, in my early career, and we tested his movies, and I think the company went bankrupt. So let's go back into the, into the literally 90s, where Critelionet, the bank that was giving the loans to the entertainment industry, was found with the bribes, and all credit lines were basically cut, oh, I remember which that. put it yes. many companies, not only his, but 20th century folks, which he had by this time, put it, uh, this in bankruptcy, and Menachem leaving everything in the United States, losing the buildings on a wheelchair in San Vicente, if you remember, there's of two buildings. Of course I remember. Did you see no, Menachem? No, I, I, I met Menachem in Israel when he came, and he did, first was the Sound of Music musical, and I met him there, and we started to work together, and then around 99, Menachem tells me, let's do a company together, let's start to do movies, because he knew that I wanted movies movies, I also did some TV stuff, and I come into Hollywood in 99 together with Menachem Golan. I started to produce, he was directing, and we did a couple of movies together. Wow, and then how did you go on your own? You know what, I will tell you. First year and second year, I realized that it's a quite expensive school. Some listeners who know the history of Menachem and Yoram will understand what I mean. I'm thankful to Menachem to open a lot of doors. Together with this, some doors are been closed for me because of my relationship with Menachem. And I deciding that I need to branch myself. I need to... Right, I need to go out on my own. Yeah. Yes. And that's... Uh, we separated uh, from our business relationship. It was uh, 2000... But amicably. Amicably. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. We were still friends after that. And I took some scripts that he uh, wrote, and we cleared rights, and I was planning to produce them and direct them, and he went his direction, and that's how I ended here and started to make my movies. And when did you make your first movie alone? And what I, was it? Believe it or not, it was a family comedy. What was it? What was the name? Oy vey, my son is gay. Oy vey, my son is gay with Lenny Kazan? Lenny Kazan, Saul Rubinek, Vincent Pastore... Uh, Bruce Villange, Carbon Electra. You raised the money for it. Yes, I did. How did you do that? You know what? I guess everyone raising the money different ways, but uh, people love the script. I rewrote it, actually. Uh, at the beginning, I not was planning to direct. And then some of my friends said, Evgeny, you see the perfect vision. You're writing this. So do it. And I actually went to a crash course at UCLA Extensions for directing, of which oh, I, love I that. directed Lenny, I directed Soul. I think you tested the movie, didn't you? Yes, I did. I, I think did. we did it Yeah, at the time. Yeah, it's a long time ago, but it was fun. Did it make any money? You know what? It's not because I end it not Oy to... Vey, my son is gay, doesn't sound like a mass appeal movie. <laughs> you know what? It was interesting because we finished this in 2008, 2009 with... Barack Obama being president with a lot of changes. Now, had you come out of the closet yet? You know what is funny? Or was that your coming out? Uh, you know what? Wait. Ha ha, mom. I'm making uh, a movie wait, called Wait, Oy wait, Vey. wait, 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 wait. No, <laughs> my, for my, for my your family. Your son is gay. That's how I came out. <laughs> uh, for my family, I came a long time ago. But it was interesting because I never in my interviews, I basically mentioned my sexual orientation. And all of a sudden, I, Bruce Villange, and... Who I absolutely love that guy. I love him too. Bruce is a great, great guy. And he'll always show up. He's such a Do you know how mensch. I met Bruce? In 2003, I'm going to CBS. And it was, I think, last year of the Hollywood Squares. And I'm going to see Whoopi, Whoopi Goldberg, because I was planning to do some slapstick. And I'm coming there and I'm meeting her and I'm meeting Bruce. And then I'm receiving from Bruce email. It's finally nice to meet the perestroika in Hollywood. <laughs> that was the email. That's great. That's and great. That's we great. became friends. Bruce is amazing. Bruce helped me. So did that movie get your foot in the door? Because how do you go from Oy Vey, My Son is Gay to the first big documentary you did, which was, was it Winter on Fire? Yeah. I had documentaries before also. What were the subject matters on those? First of all, when I was a kid in Russia, I did documentary on a club of the people who were creating a small planes and flying them for the competition. Yeah. That was done when I was... Uh, a full length? 
No, it was a short. It was less than 40 minutes. But I did, between Oive and Winter, I did doc. I did doc on uh, kids, on divorced kids, because when I was... Um, after we, after Oive, I had a period of time that I was looking what what is next for me, and I met people who were helping me to raise money, and uh, one of them were a lady that divorced and her kids were going through some divorce process, and I saw a high numbers of divorced parents mm, with the kids, sure. and that's made me to do a movie for the kids about divorce from kids. For kids, because you know what, as a grown ups, you have luxury. If you have some issues, you can always go hire a therapist and go. What about kids? Powerless. Correct. So I wanted to do something that will be from the kids who found their own ways to cope with the situation of the divorce to share their experience. I venture to say that you probably were healing your own life in the process. True. It was one of the things because I was a product. And so I want to ask you about that. So you go from that to Winter on Fire. What moved you to make that movie? Documentaries clearly are tough. They're hard to make. They're hard to raise money for. And you did it. For me, docs much easier to do than the features. You know why? Feature, you need to have a great script. Then you need to find and raise money because you need to hire a talent then you need to have blah, 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 blah. And it's not a one or two minutes uh, usual a great product, which we see in, in a scripted feature kind of uh, world, needs not one or two, much more from three and a half, yes, five and a half. You don't know what you're going to get. Is it sort of scripted out how you want it to go? Docs? Do you have, yes. No. Docs, you starting with one idea, you ending with another idea. Uh, what, would, what did you start with in Winter on Fire? One of my friends who was in Ukraine, he called me and he said, listen, something happening here. Come and this let's... This is prior to... Give me the year. In 2013, Putin trying to create his Euro-Asian Union. Yanukovych is negotiating same time with European Union entry of Ukraine into European Union. And all of a sudden, Yanukovych starting to go towards the direction of Russia instead of European Union. And the protests erupted in Ukraine. One of my friends was there. We're talking about November. And literally a couple of days of the protest, I'm finding myself in Ukraine, in Kiev, and we're starting to film. So you set out to make this movie to document the protests and the unrest yep. and what will be the toppling of the Ukrainian leader at that time. Listen, the protests ended with ousting him. He's fleeing to Russia in February and the parliament recognizing him as no longer president and making new elections in May 2014. Now, Putin, who obviously losing control over Ukraine because his own uh, person is gone, 2014, next year. Because the protests and the whole events were 93 days, three months. So started the end of November, ended end of February, three months. And exactly, annexation of Crimea was around 2021 of February 2014. That's the beginning of the real war. So people. the Russians just marched into Crimea. Yes, but and, not in a way. And how the Ukrainians. We, no, never... wait. It was done very specific way. They created a referendum, and they put it the military as observers and people peacekeepers, and they technically un did annexation. So that's how annexation happens. All this you can see in really proper perspective in my new movie, uh, Freedom on Fire, which we are just talking about. And Zelensky became, five years later, president elected in 2019. Because of his promise of what he actually did? Was that why he got elected? Remember, Zelensky also played a president in a TV series called The Servant of the People. And literally all the... The comedian, right? Or is he's he? a great comedian. I met, believe it or not, I met Zelensky in 2016. One of my friends introduced us. In 2016, I was finishing my movie, Christ from Syria, also in Ukraine, because I did all post-production of the movie for Christ from Syria, also in Ukraine. It's interesting. Since Maidan, I doing a lot of sound work. 
and we are in a great sound facility, but I'm doing a lot of sound work in uh, Kiev and Ukraine oh, good. with my team, with whom I started to work in 2014 for the Winter on Fire. So I was there in 2016, and I was introduced to him. How did you get on? We've been introduced, and we started to interact, and uh, he was telling me his ideas. I was telling him that I want also to do some something about Jewish stuff, uh, on a, because we both Jewish. So we wanted to do something on a Jewish topic. So he he was telling me his ideas. I was so it was interesting collaboration, brainstorming. And what about there. Syria? Uh, how did you do that from Ukraine? Did you get into Syria? As yeah, a, I, did. I did. As a Jew, how did you get in? First of all, I'm American citizen, but you can't go official channels to Syria. 2013, America broke ties with Syria. It was after Gias Matar's murder, and America literally dissolved all the relationship with Syria. And the only way to get to Aleppo was smuggling. So I did it. Listen, I did a lot of crazy stuff in my life. I uh, know you did. Kavali. You really put your life really in danger in many times. It's true, but you know what? Sometimes to document the stories comes with the territory and the evaluation realization of what you just did comes later. What happens when you learn that Winter on Fire is nominated for the Academy Award? Where did you learn that you were nominated? I landed in Vilnius. I was invited by the army and the government to celebrate their 25th anniversary of Russian attempt to crush people in Vilnius. It's a story that in January 1991, when Russian tanks were next to the TV station in Vilnius, killing people. So in 2016, it was 25 year anniversary, and they decided to show Winter on Fire. And I was invited, and I landing, and the people from the army meeting me in the airport, and all of a sudden the phone starts ringing, one after another. And I've... I got a message that I was just nominated. Who told you? One of my friends called me from New York. And then I what got a call. What did you do when you heard? I was speechless. And then I got a call from Netflix. And Netflix said, where are, you? where are you? I said, I'm abroad. They said, you need to be here as quick as possible. And then my amazing, she's a publicist. She was executive at Netflix. Amazing person, Electra Gray, who was like, like a sister through the whole period of time giving me backing and, and she called me and said Evgeny there is so many things you people wants to hear from you can you do some statements can you do some sound bites and I'm like yes I'm here I'm on my cell phone if somebody needs to call please give them a cell phone and that's the whole story but starts. then you went back and you were you attended yes two days later I was already in LA ah. yeah because I what was what was that night like you know it's interesting because Many of the listeners probably been there and many dreaming to be there. And it was a dream. It was a reality. Did you take your mom? Yeah, I was with my mom. I actually had also some of your friends. I think your dear friend David Dinerstein was with me, who was one of the APs of the movie. David was a producer of it? Executive producer. Wow. Yeah. And then he went on to win the Academy Award, didn't he? For, um, la, uh, for, the, um, for Summer of Soul. Summer of Soul, yeah. Oh, by the way, he went together with Robert, who is my attorney till today, Robert Freeland, and Robert was the producer of the show. But actually, David introduced me to Robert, and till today, I am So, Robert like, yeah, it's, inter uh, yeah. interconnected, yes. And by the way, yes. I met David when I was doing uh, Oy Vey, My Son is Gay, and... I will tell you who introduced between us. If you remember a freestyle releasing company, Susan... Um, Susan um, Jackson. Yeah, who is no longer with us. I know. Susan introduced me to David when David was just out of Paramount Classics and uh, he was ready to run the campaign for Oye My Son is Gay. That's why you did research, because David was involved that's in right. all these things in right. freestyle. That's right. So you see, here I'm connecting you the dots of yes. the history. I love it. I love it. When we come back, we're going to take a little break. I want to hear about Francesco. We'll be back in a moment. Get a glimpse into a secret part of Hollywood that few are aware of and that filmmakers rarely talk about. In the new book, Audienceology by Kevin Getz. Each chapter is filled with never before revealed inside stories and interviews from famous studio chiefs, directors, producers, and movie stars, bringing the art and science of Audienceology into focus. Audienceology. 
how moviegoers shape the films we love. From Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster. Available now. We're back with Yevgeny Afinievsky. One of my favorite things when I'm introducing my friend Yevgeny to people is, oh, he's best friends with the Pope. I mean, how many people can say that? Now, there's not many people that I would actually get on a plane to meet, go across the ocean. But of course, the Pope, Pope Francis, is one of them. And you did a documentary on his life. And I'd love to hear about how you became so close to him and what your relationship is like today. You know, I think at the beginning of the conversation, you said that all my dogs, they're impactful. And they're all about impact. I thought you said my dogs. Oh, no. Do- you have a beautiful <laughs> dogs. I have only dogs, documentaries. Uh, but I will tell you something. I found with making my documentaries, like about kids, four kids, Winter on Fire, which impacted many places. Hong Kong, 2019. The whole revolution was inspired by this, by Winter on Fire. Venezuela, Nicaragua, Brazil, Lebanon, beginning of Yellow West in France started with our documentary, inspiration based on the Ukrainian revolution. I think for me, all my documentaries became AAA, Advocacy, Activism, Action, Call for Action. And I think when I, after Winter on Fire and Christ from Syria, came out with quite heavy post-trauma, PTSD and depression and uh, nightmares. I was seeing from you one side... You had nightmares and I depression did. I... and post-traumatic... Listen, like every human, wow. like every soldier who going into the war field and seeing things... Listen, if you will see... There's d- in your doc, there's a person who dies in front of you. Or Correct. It, but I also it, it, saw beheading by ISIS... Uh, in, and in Christ from Syria, you see only half oh, of these dear things. Oh, God. So, dear God. Yes. And uh, listen, Aleppo. Aleppo was falling in front of me. So, yes, it's um, it's it's a tough thing. So, like every soldier, you you have any PTSD and you're trying to deal with this. But in the same time, as a filmmaker, you're seeing how important your job and how important what you do because you become an inspiration to the people. Your stories become an inspiration. You're able to inspire people to do good things. So I was looking... Is that what drives you? I think, yes. I think that's what drew me last year back to the war. Because I not was planning to do anything in Ukraine. When always I was asked after being on fire, if I ever go back to Ukraine and do another movie, I said, no, no, no. I want other filmmakers in Ukraine do the stories about the war. Beautiful. But you know what? It's not happened. I realized last year you that I need to go. You picked up the mantle. Yeah. yeah. You lived in Israel, did your time in the military, and you came to L.A. and made these movies. And now you want to also apply, I want to change the world. Why the Pope? Why Francis? Okay. So I was seeing a lot of disasters around us growing. And at the same time, I saw hope to change things from climate change to refugee to migration because of Syria to Middle East to the social issues with the women empowerment that Hollywood was uh, all trying to bring kind of up and empower women, give them more visibility in different aspects or, for example, sexual abuse, which I saw a lot in the church. And at the same time, the civil unions and the gay marriages and everything. I wanted to find the way how I can connect all these things together and find hope. And then somebody said to me, what about Pope Francis? And I said, what about him? Yes, he's the head of the church and the church has sexual abuse and all these things. And he said, no, just go and learn and see. And I'm taking a dive into, I love research, I love analyze. And I'm finding that it's all close to his heart. And he is caring about every person. Because I think for Pope, Pope Francis, there is no labels, there is no stickers on the people. It's human being. It doesn't matter which religion you are, which color, which your sexuality. No, you are the human being. And I decided to do the movie. But how I get into Vatican? So I tried to write to the Dicastery of Communication. Some people went there, nothing. Then I learned that somebody 
the head of Dicastery of Communications of Vatican, was also a judge in Venice. So I went to my dear friend, who is amazing friend, an amazing human being. You know him, Alberto Barbera, director of the Venice Film Festival, the person who, despite everything last year, invited us without seeing the movie. And uh, I'm writing to him, calling to him and saying, Alberto, I need your help. Immediately, Alberto took my letter to uh, Monsignor Dario Vigano. He was the chief of communications of the Vatican, uh, of the whole dicastery. Uh, nothing. I'm coming to... Alberto suggested to me go in person. When I arrived to Rome, I met some other people and they all said, you need to go to Vatican. So I went to Vatican. I met with Dario. Dario immediately replied to me when I arrived. He said, you can go, start doing a movie, but I'm not promising you any meeting with the Pope. Or any cooperation, yes. No. Wow. Like everybody else, just go and start. I wonder how many people before you had tried. Oh, many. And I will tell you something else. You're probably familiar. Amazing filmmaker by name Wim Wenders did the movie before me. Wim Wenders did? Yes. And I'm sure... A documentary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pope Francis, the man of the world. And I'm sure you tested this movie. Just think about it. I'm this. not sure, but I because was Because it was universal. It. it was... I think it was universal. Wow. So what you did to differentiate yourself, I think the listeners will really like. You. I, I think you, what you, I did, you, I you realized... decided to go back further. Correct, because... In Francis's life. But Kevin, as a filmmaker, I want to tell to the listeners one thing. Believe in yourself and never give up. Mm. That's one of the things that I think as the kid who born in Russia, who was dreaming to be a filmmaker, trust me, I have a camera at home. I will send you a picture today later. Mm. Camera that is uh, almost uh, 35, 40 years old, the same camera that I did my first 16 millimeter movie, which I literally developed in a dark room with the chemicals that I found in Oh, you must places. have loved the Fablemans. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I spliced yeah, it yeah, in yeah, a little yeah. viola. So I have still this camera at home. And uh, Oh, isn't that wonderful? That's so great. You had this passion to, as a filmmaker, you were saying, Getting to the essence. So, yes. So, of never give man. up. So, never give up. And what I'm doing, I realized that, okay, if I can't go through the traditional ways, I need to start from the beginning. I think it's important always to start from the beginning. And the beginning is Argentina. You yes. flew to Argentina? In 2018, I went On your March, own dime? On my own dime on March. And I started to meet from his relatives to his close friends. I started to interview them. That's why I'm telling you that documentaries, to do documentaries is easier than the features because you're taking your own camera and you're going. You certainly have more control. True. You don't, need, you, a, you don't need a yes at that point. Correct. And you also don't need the millions of dollars for that. You need to uh, be able to backpack and to go. So I'm coming. I met all, a lot of his friends and I even met a daughter of his former girlfriend who passed away a couple of years ago, before my arrival to Argentina. So I really meeting a lot of interesting, fascinating people and slowly learning about this person who I made, wants to make a movie. And at the same time, I'm learning about a lot of great people in Vatican who potentially can assist me to get different messages to but him. But why did they now... Had you shown them footage? Why did they now kind of begin to trust you to forge that introduction? I think after two of my movies, Winch on Fire and Christ from Syria, I already gaining credibility. That was your calling card. You proved that you can do it. Correct. So you weren't just some person off the street. You were now an Academy Award nominated filmmaker who now has gone to Argentina, interviewed the Pope's family. And friends. And yeah. friends. And so you finally get the, the audience with... His Holiness. No, you know what? It's still a long journey because when I arrived back... But documentaries aren't difficult. No. <laughs> I still had a long journey until I started to meeting this person. I still I started to shake his hand and getting him my letters and telling him about myself and developing kind of relationship. It's but you do speak Spanish, I want to say, and the Pope's uh, primary yeah. language is Spanish. True. And so but we speak in Spanglish. I think uh, I mix yeah. in my English <laughs> and Spanish, and he doing the same thing for me, and it's interesting. It's he doesn't he, speak English very English. well, fluently, yes. correct? Yeah. But he understands But English. he has five languages, correct? Uh, oh, he have, uh, that he speaks fluently. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Spanish, Latin, German, Italian, Italian, and oh, what else? What's the other one? Oh, I don't know because that's the practical what we are around us all the time. Oh, that's fantastic. So I can tell you another thing. He was talking to uh, Portenio, the, Bra- the Portuguese, uh, when last time I was uh, with uh, some friends with him. Yevgeny showed me a video of his birthday, I believe it was last year or no, the year before. It was actually October 2020 when all the world was on lockdown. Okay, so three years ago, Yevgeny said to me, let me show you this. And it was the Pope and a couple of his inner circle and yourself and him singing, happy birthday to you, happy birthday. He made everybody And he had sing. the cake. Yeah. I wonder if he made the cake. But I love the story and your relationship with him. It has really become so close. And I do want to mention that two and a half years ago, a miracle happened. Eugeny became a single father. Well, he became a single father a year and nine months ago. But two and a half years ago was when his son came to be. He was born, and as a Jewish man, what do you do? You bring your child to the Pope to get him baptized. I thought that was incredible, after his bris, let's just say. And what's so great about that is he's become your baby's godfather. He is, and he really deeply cares for him. It's it's remarkable. With all his busy schedules, today he just re- returned back from the hospital, and I heard from him. He he was in touch with me actually today, and two days ago he was in touch with me. I have to tell listeners this. He texts directly to Yevgeny. It's not like an interpreter, so he gets texts from no, the Pope. it's messages, it's letters. Yeah, it's letters. And letters. But you say when you text him, he... You get him from him back, yeah? Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible. He's about to pull his phone out. Oh, Lord. So I am going to go over to Italy in the fall, and Evgeny is taking me in to meet His Holiness, and I am overjoyed. And many of my Catholic friends, particularly my Catholic friends, are really jealous. I want to talk about your son for a moment and say you have put yourself in harm's way a lot, and I saw... Some of it in Winter on Fire. You saw it also in a new one, Freedom on Fire. So do you now have a different perspective, now that you have a son, about the, what you're willing to put yourself through? I think last year when I was filming Freedom on Fire, the new basically companion piece to Winter on Fire about the whole Ukrainian invasion, I think it's it's made me to reevaluate a lot of things. When I was filming some of the interviews and I had little kids like my son around me, and I was holding them, I saw how they're missing their male figure in their life. Because their fathers were either fighting Mm -hmm. on the front lines, or for some of them, their fathers were already in the Russian captivity. And for me, I remember not one time, many times break down when I was leaving Ukraine after the filming period. It was tough because I was fine. You know what? You probably run on adrenaline while you are there. But then adrenaline is gone when you live in the war zone and you're coming back to the peaceful world, which is there across the border in Poland. And then you're flying to Rome, you're flying to America. And you know what? I think that's moments were really tough. I remember how I came last and it was May, June last year, April. And all of a sudden, I was three days in a closed bedroom. I didn't want to see anybody. I not was able to even eat. I My nanny and Frankie were all the time worried about me. And Frankie is my son. He wanted to see me, and she was surprised. But I was just decompressing, decompressing, and I was trying to find the way how to regain the strengths and the emotions back. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's... Thank uh, you for sharing that with us. And I want to also mention that your passion, and when you talk about Frankie, named after Francis, I imagine, is extraordinary. It's the way in which you speak about him, you light up, and I can only imagine you're the most glorious father. Thank you. But also, he helps me to go through the PTSD. You bet. I will tell you. you. He helps me to go through some of these dark moments, which I saw a lot in my life. And he gives me motivation of why I do these movies. Because at the end of the day, in these dark days for the world, 
we sometimes thinking, what is next? What is tomorrow? You know what? The next will be what we will create. It all depends on us. And it's a lot of times depends on us, on the filmmakers, because we are the ones who can change the world, specifically in these days when propaganda, when fake media, when all these lies are getting through different sources of social media or channel media, we as filmmakers, we can educate the world, we can bring the truth, we can bring spotlight on the issues and change them. And it's us who can create a better future for our kids. That is a clarion call for young filmmakers and I think a beautiful message to impart. Film in general, movies, television, the media can really change our world, perspectives, educating, all of those things that I love about what we all do and are a part of. You know, I'd love to get your perspective on why documentaries right now have really gone to that hierarchy, top of the hierarchy, if you will, or certainly higher than they've ever been. I would say in the last five years, that's a phenomenon. People are much more interested than sort of in the world at large, as opposed to just that niche audience that maybe 20 years ago you would see. Why is that? But Kev, let's look at the world right now. Let's look at the world since pandemic. We started to live in a bubble. When we opened the news, and before it was a TV, we were looking at the segment of the news for two, three minutes. We don't know what was before. We don't know what will happen after. So we just, in a moment, and then next day we're having something else. And next day something else happening somewhere else, and it's gone. The documentary, like every story, have beginning, middle, and end. We educating our audience. We bring in spotlight from different parts of the planet and telling them the story. Remember, when I brought Winter on Fire, nobody knew exactly about Ukraine as a country. For the first time, people learned that there is Russia and there is Ukraine. And then, after Winter on Fire, people also learned about Courageous Nation and the people in Ukraine and all what's happening there. But not much people saw the footage even, what's happened there. But that's not unique to documentaries. That's always existed, bringing attention to it. But for some reason, documentaries as a genre... The style has taken a different turn in a larger way and more appealing to more folks. And I think it's probably the streamers that are responsible for it. Listen. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Because when I came to Netflix in 2014 with the first cut of Vinch on Fire and amazing Lisa Nishamura and Adam Dildeo and Ted Sarandos came and literally shaked my hand and said, deal, we're bringing this up. It was the golden era. It was the golden era because two years before me, it was the square. Then it was Virunga. Then it was me. And it was beautiful to see how they literally started to pull more and more and mm. more dogs. And before that, it was Sheila, Sheila Nevins, who was front runner of his HBO. So it was a great people who were championing our product, our great artistic filmmaking product that was a great storytelling product also. And they were bringing this to the a lot of eyeballs, bringing this and educating people. And I think, like you said, streamers, streamers created the love to the dogs. And today, the more and more and more fascinating outlets being born. Now, Last year, we can say that it's been shuffled. Like today, we know that discovery... Well, then there was a glut. Like anything else, there were so many of them made. And then the bar gets raised yeah. to how good they need to be, the subject matter, how far they touch different audiences, etc. Do you have a particular documentary filmmaker that you really admire at the moment? You know what... For Winter on Fire, for me, was a great inspiration with Johan, who did Square, and we had amazing friends. I was also influenced a lot with Brett Morgan, who really was my influence on the personalities, because all his movies are personalities. And I learned a lot from Brett when I was doing Francesco movie. Johan, Brett, they are great friends. I always happy to see Matthew Heinemann, who also doing a great stories from the front lines. Ondi, she is an amazing storyteller. I'm talking about the really filmmakers mm-hmm, whom mm-hmm. 
I admire and from whom I can always learn something. And I'm sure they learn from you as well. I mean that because you are such a pro and so detailed in your storytelling. I was so moved by Winter on Fire and now, of course, Freedom on Fire. I'm just going to cut to the chase because you've shared this with me. Freedom on Fire is hard to find the ending for because there's no ending to the war. So you will ultimately, and I think soon, find a way to tie it up even before the war ends, and then probably, I would imagine, hopefully have a third movie to give us the resolution. But is there a particular other subject that's brewing inside Yuvgeny right now? Oh, there is a lot. I don't give me want... one that's really like, oh, I really want to tell the story of, or this thing really interests me. No, there is a couple of them that I'm right now thinking to do. One is about Ukrainian kids that have been abducted. And that have been brought to Russia to be raised as Russian kids. That's just abducted. a heartbreaking you know what, and, and story. And I'm also seeing how they've been used as part of the propaganda. The Freedom on Fire that you saw, you saw that I really paid attention a lot to propaganda because it is horrifying how dictators of our days started to use the manual of Joseph Goebbels from 1939 as their manual. And today we can see Putin, many other great dictators of today's world using this manual as their playbook. And that's how the birth of fake news been done. It's all coming from the same playbook of Goebbels. Take a lie big enough, repeat it over and over, how some of our leaders doing, and it becomes truth. Mm. And there is another say mm-hmm. of Goebbels, truth is an enemy of the state. Wow. Yeah. Yevgeny Afinievsky, I am so grateful that you were here. I thank you for your contribution to citizens and to the world. You are making us look at things in a different way, and it's really enlightening and very touching to talk about these very personal stories. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin, for having me here, and I hope... We can bring the change as a filmmakers. You doing change your way, I'm doing change my way. And like on Maidan, on Winter on Fire, was a poster. And it was a big drop of water. And below was a sign. Each of us is a drop of water. Together, we're an ocean. So together, we can change this world. Wow. To our listeners, I hope you enjoyed our interview. I encourage you to check out Yevgeny's documentaries and follow him on social media at Yevgeny underscore director. For other stories like this one, please check out my book, Audienceology, at Amazon or through my website at KevinGets360.com. You can also follow me on my social media at KevinGets360. Next time on Don't Kill the Messenger, we will welcome the incredibly talented director and producer Antoine Fuqua. Until then, I'm Kevin Getz, and to you, our listeners, I appreciate you being part of the movie-making process. Your opinions matter.